Hello and welcome to today's South Talk, featuring a Q&A with filmmaker Mary Blessing and Ralph Eubanks. Today's screening and Q&A is co-hosted by the Oxford Film Festival and the Center for the Study of Southern Culture. My name is Andy Harper and I'm the director of the Southern Documentary Project, which is an institute of the Center for the Study of Southern Culture. Before I introduce Mary and Ralph, I'd like to uh, first mention a few upcoming programs here at the Center. Tomorrow at 3 p.m., these are all central time, there will be a South Talk with Adam Gusso, Brian Foster, and Ken Kawashima, where they'll talk about Adam's new book, Who's Blues? Facing Up to Race and the Future of the Music. Next week, we take a week off from South Talks, but the Center is offering a virtual open house on Friday, November 6th at 3 p.m. Central. Then this semester's South Talk series will wrap up with three events all focused on documentary work. On Wednesday, November 11th, Charles Reagan Wilson will moderate the conversation between Ralph Eubanks and David Wharton discussing their upcoming books, both of which focus on the Southern landscape. The next day, Thursday, November 12th at 7 p.m. Central, documentary filmmaker and professor Jackie Olive will talk about representation in her documentary film, Always in Season. And on Friday, November 13th, that seems appropriate, we will close the semester with the center's fourth annual documentary showcase where you'll get to see what our students have been working on. Pretty excited about that one, so please join us. Please check out the center's website for more information about these events. And now let us turn our attention to the reason we're all here today. A discussion in Q&A with filmmaker Mary Blessy and Ralph Eubanks on Mary's documentary, You Asked for the Facts, Bobby Kennedy at the University of Mississippi. Mississippi. Allow me first to introduce my colleague, Ralph Eubanks. W. Ralph Eubanks is a visiting professor of Southern Studies, English, and the Sally McDonald Barksdale Honors College. Eubanks is author of The House at the End of the Road, the story of three generations of an interracial uh, family in, uh, in the American South, and Ever is a Long Time, A Journey into Mississippi's Dark Past. Ralph has contributed articles to Washington Post's Outlook and Style sections, The Wall Street Journal, Wired, The New Yorker, and National Public Radio. He's a recipient of the 2007 Guggenheim Fellowship and has been a fellow at the New American Foundation. Ralph is former editor of the Virginia Quarterly and served as director of publishing at the Library of Congress from 1995 to 2013. It is also my distinct pleasure to introduce Mary Plessy. Mary Plessy is a Mississippi filmmaker and recent graduate of the Center's MFA program in documentary expression. Mary also received her MA in Southern Studies here at the University of Mississippi. Her film, You Asked for the Facts, is an expansion of Mary's MFA thesis project at the center, which I was fortunate enough to work with as her committee chair. You Asked for the Facts has been an, an official selection at the March on Washington Film Festival, the Montclair Film Festival, received special jury recognition at the Oxford Film Festival, and recently was awarded the Artistic Director's Award at the San Diego International Film Festival. It should go without saying that we're very proud of Mary as she has set the bar high for our MFA graduates in our program in documentary expression. So now it's my pleasure to turn the floor over to my colleague, Ralph Eubanks. Thanks. Thank you, Andy. Thank um, you, Andy. It's a pleasure being here with, with Mary and talking about her film. Um, Mary's also a former student of mine in my Image of the American South class. And it's interesting to me watching this film, seeing how um, this idea of, of image really plays a role in how this, this film takes shape. Uh, I was really taken by this because I was about, I think it was about 10 years old when all of this, when this happened. I was a kind of a weird news junkie kid, nerdy news junkie kid. I think nobody's really surprised by that. And was following all of this. And I was just curious, Mary, is this, you know, given that your father's involved, was this a story you grew up hearing about? Yeah, I get that question a lot. Um, and the truth is, I don't remember, it's not as though I remember hearing about it like as a little kid. I mean, I definitely remember learning about it more, um, I think in college and after college and graduate school. But the main thing that sticks out in my mind, I'm sure I heard about it and, and didn't really appreciate the historical significance more fully until later. But what sticks out in my mind, and you and I were kind of talking about this the other day, of being from the coast and when you have a family that's been on the coast for generations and the way that things are kind of punctuated by hurricanes. And I'm saying that as I look out the window right now, we're gearing up for a storm right now, this afternoon, this evening. But I always remember hearing that one of the things that my dad really regretted losing in Camille was you know, all of his photos. And one of the photos he lost in Camille was a photo of him 
driving the car with uh, Robert Kennedy this day at the school. So he was actually, that happened to be one of his part-time jobs anyway on campus, even though he was also involved, involved in this speech. And so anyway, we may get in more into this later, but it's funny to think that they just had him pick them up from the airport, but he had a photo of um, himself and Robert Kennedy and Ethel Kennedy in the car and a reporter and a Secret Service guy sandwiched in between them in the front seat. And he always said that was one of the things he, he really regrets losing in the storm. So that's my memory of hearing about that photograph. And then my imagination being wanting to know more about that photograph and what was the story behind that. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I think um, to me about my, my adult children, things that I told them that all of a sudden, you never told me about that. I said, yes, I did. I probably talked about it all the time. You just weren't listening. Uh, so it's, it's good to see that someone else's kids do that too. Um, I, you know, I was taken at the beginning uh, of the film when your dad is on camera and he says, everyone wins <clears throat> when justice is done. Justice is only done when truth is the victor. And you know, as I said, he says in the opening, is that something that really this idea of kind of finding the truth and also making this this somewhat little known event, I think by a, a, a lot of people, kind of understanding the significance of that. What was the, was that one of your motivations behind doing this film? Was kind of getting more deeply into the truth of this? Absolutely. Um, so, so, so there's multiple layers of that because the event being documented in the film is all about revealing the truth of these phone tapes at the time. And so then we also have this film itself, 50 something years later, which is further documenting a, a documentation. <laughs> um, but it's, yes, it was important for me to revisit this story, especially working on this film over the last couple of years, um, living in Mississippi most of my life, growing up in Mississippi and knowing that so many people uh, that I've known um, have learned uh, such a sanitized history of this time period, or they don't know what's really behind the name of the Ross Barnett Reservoir, or they don't know these things. And so revisiting and really showing this is what happened, this is what kind of leader this person is, but also diving into this really interesting story with these crafty law students who had this plan at the law school to bring him and everything. I just found it to be uh, a story that all of these different issues could circle around. But certainly that idea, um, that theme of revealing the truth and the idea of um, the quote you're saying about truth being the victor, which is of course kind of a, the, the general theme in the film that the idea is that you don't, uh, you don't hide, you don't keep the truth from people so you can tell on what to think. It should be certainly at a university of all places, there's a marketplace of ideas. If people actually know the facts and information, they should be able to decide for themselves. That's the idea that everyone, everyone wins when everyone has access to correct information and then hopefully can make some kind of logical judgment. But that's not what's happening if you have, for instance, a speaker ban that is literally keeping certain information out. So that was kind of the theme of that. Let's talk a little bit about this, the speaker band, because you know one of the things I'm really um, was taken by was this the way that you know just the crafty law students were finding ways to work around this speaker band. And what was it that um, could you just kind of tell us a little bit about what the speaker band was? I mean, I think it's something that's it is a uh, it's a a characteristic of the, the old Mississippi closed society. But I think, think people who may be listening might not even really know that there was such thing even existed at one time. Right. So the speaker ban was actually adopted and enforced by the uh, Institutions of Higher Learning Board, the IHL, which was appointed by the governor at the time. Um, and it was essentially um, a, a regulation that said that no one is allowed to speak on a public college campus in Mississippi without, the, without going up the chain of command and eventually getting the approval of the IHL, which is basically, and this is a quote from the film, it's, it's essentially a direct assault on the First Amendment, that you have public campus universities 
Um, and the idea that you have this appointed board, these people are not elected by the people, that gets to decide who can speak or not if they're from outside Mississippi. And it's such a clear and obvious uh, attempt, particularly during this time period, to keep out um, a certain type of views they didn't want in the, this closed society of Mississippi. That was, that was essentially you know, the, the motive. Um, so you had to get the approval of um, the dean and the chancellor, and they are ultimately under the IHL. So it's certainly an overreach, and it was overturned um, in federal court a couple years later. I think it was 69. There was a case, um, Ole Miss students and MSU students together um, brought that case, and it was overturned as unconstitutional. But during this time in 66, it was still in place. Right, and you know, that's also, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that there's also the specter of the Mississippi State Sovereignty Commission hovering all of this because all of these various organizations whether it's the IHL board, the governor, you know, the you know, university officials, they are all having to work with the Sovereign Commission and actually do their bidding um, because <clears throat> the idea was these were people who were coming in to take the sovereignty of Mississippi or really trying to bring ideas in Mississippi, which kind of brings you know, to mind the uh, the, the campaign song for Ross Barnett, because Ross Barnett's about to run for governor again. And as I told you, I am old enough to remember when that was on the radio so almost every time I got in the car when I was a kid and the radio was on, we would hear it. I think my mother would immediately turn to a station out in New Orleans so she wouldn't have to hear it. But I still know the lyrics to the Ross Barnett campaign song. So, oh, you want me to sing now? <laughs> roll again, roll again, roll again with Ross. Ross Barnett is still the man for me. He will lead our state to victory in Mississippi. He will keep our sovereignty. Roll again, roll again, roll again with Ross. So they even work in the name word sovereignty. <laughs> right, right. And working Bobby Kennedy into it too. That's the clip of that song in the film is the part where it says, um, we something something we're with ross all along the way but we won't hand over our state to little bobby k you know throwing in those jabs but i i um i relate in that i was not around at the time but editing this film when i was editing that sequence with that song it was stuck in my head all the time like it was it such an earworm i'd be like humming the ross barnett song i'd be like i've got to stop like this is i can't oh I think, there, I think there was a Southern Studies thesis or a political science dissertation on the role of campaign songs in getting Southern segregationist um, politicians elected uh, because they were these earworms and that kind of got in there. So yeah, I mean, if, if a 10 year old kid is, can remember that, you know, 50 some odd years later, that's, it's, a, it's quite an earworm. Um, do you want, want to look a little bit at the kind of Ross and show yeah. to be honest a little bit about that? For sure. Get it. So I'm going to start this clip. It's a little bit before that part. So there's kind of a lead in so you understand the context. Um, Y'all are seeing my screen, I imagine. Yes. Yes. Okay. So we're going to start here and play for about two minutes. Does that sound good? Yeah. In 67, I think at the outset, people thought that uh, he would be a hard figure to beat. Barnett 
Bernie had a reputation of just kind of blundering blunderbuss, and we, we all thought he was a complete buffoon, something of a fool. Uh, he was constantly doing goofy things. So he, he, was a, he was a laughable figure of mythic proportions here in Mississippi history. He'd been a trial lawyer, made a lot of money appealing to juries. So he was, he was tall and gregarious, he used language that a six-year-old would understand. He appealed to uh, racial hatred and bias. Oh, he was a quintessential demagogue. My conscience is clear. I am moved only by deep and abiding affection for the welfare of all of the people of Mississippi. Okay, so that's just kind of a, a brief clip of the, the Ross Barnett section. So but little, you definitely hear the song in there. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, a, it's a little scary to, to think about someone like Ross Barnett um, you know, coming back as a um, political figure. This is after the passage of the Voting Rights Act, after the passage of the Civil Rights Act. And yet he is, he's back on the political scene. And, and is, that, is that kind of this idea of Ross Barnett being back on the political scene, one of the things that, that um, kind of led to these students, these, you know, these very crafty law students wanting to get Bobby Kennedy to Ole Miss to talk about the whole role of Barnett in the, um, in the Ole Miss, in, in the integration crisis at Ole Miss. You know, the whole thing where he had, he asked John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy on, the, on a phone call, on a recorded phone call, had, them, had the marshals pull a gun on him just so he could say, he could say to everyone, I had to do this because they pulled a gun on me. Right. right, which is so absurd. And it's absurd to think you actually have a governor of a state acting this way or, or any other leader. Um, but, and, and certainly kind of frightening parallels past and present. But um, yes, that was absolutely part of the stated goal of the law students and part of what we kind of learn in the film and go through is that they saw, so this group of law students saw, uh, I suppose, an opportunity to try to even just even further damage Barnett's reputation, um, knowing that he was up for re-election the following year in 67. Now, and Ross Barnett did lose the following year, um, but there, you know, historically there's a number of factors involved. As you said, you've had the passage of the Voting Rights Act at this point. You have, you know, four years have passed of civil rights movement in Mississippi. There's certainly many factors that go into it, but part of their goal, part of their motivation, this group of Law School Speakers Bureau was, we want to get this information revealed about Ross and we want to do it before the election next year because it, it's very exposing of him. Uh, so, and they actually say in the film, like, we, we staged this, essentially. And of course, you have the question of Bobby Kennedy's motivation. I mean, he's certainly a strategic thinker. He had had Ross Barnett, a thorn in his side, um, and had to deal with all of that four years earlier. There's actually um, a, a famous uh, little story I've seen written about places and quoted places, but it didn't make it into the film about how during the Cuban Missile Crisis in October, shortly after the James Meredith Crisis, kind of all happening at the same time that year, um, there's a quote of Bobby Kennedy being in a room and saying something like um, about the missiles, like, can they reach Oxford, Mississippi? Like sarcastically, because they he had just been, you know, he had had this whole event. And so he also knows that he's coming down to Mississippi, or I would argue that he knows. I can't speak for what he knows or doesn't know, but I, he, he clearly knows he's coming down um, to, to reveal some very pertinent information about this person who's about to be up running for election the next year. So there's several uh, angles and motivation of political strategy going on here. Yeah, and then, you know, the, the, that whole tape that you wrote in there is, is very revealing. I think it also reveals another little historic fact that um, that maybe people who watch the film may not have been aware of. Because Ross Barnett actually says that why don't we pay for him to go out of state? 
And that's something that Mississippi did a lot for, particularly for advanced degrees. You know, they paid for my father to go to um, a graduate program in Texas so that, because there was a program there that, so that he wouldn't go to Mississippi State to take the same class, even though it was available in the state. So they had a program that did just that, that used taxpayer money to send black people out of the state so they wouldn't ask to go to school in state for a program they already had. So, I mean, so when, when he's saying that, I'm thinking, this is what, you know, this is one of those little things no one really probably remembers. It's one of those, I, mean, that's, I think that's why you have so many people from, especially black people from Mississippi who are graduates of graduate programs, say at Wisconsin, at Indiana, all of these schools that took them in. Um, so Ross Barnett is kind of complicit in all of this. Um, and I guess the, the, the thing that, you know, he's, Kennedy knows that he's coming to Mississippi and he's coming into this, you know, somewhat hostile terrain, but they're a little bit surprised by how, what they, what they find. Um, I think that's one of the things that happens when you speak with, with Ethel Kennedy. But I was also taken back that, that she said that she sat down and she started to look for the door. How, when you were talking with her, um, were you surprised to hear her say that she was looking for the door? Um, was I surprised? No. Maybe surprised that she admitted it. I don't know. <laughs> um, it makes sense in the context when you, when you uh, learn about the history. And especially at that point, by the time I interviewed her, of course, I had been going through these archives of all these letters, like some of the ones I shared with you. And I, I actually have those pulled up if we even want to look at any of those. And they're in the film as well. The, the hate mail, death threats, threats to Bobby Kennedy. It was a deluge of phone calls and letters to the Dean when news broke that this event was gonna happen. And of course you have the context of everything that's going on in Mississippi at that time and it, over the last several years. And you had just had uh, Freedom Summer and the, the three civil rights workers killed in Neshoba County. And you'd had, uh, you know, there's so much going on and of course, watching the film today, we also know when we watch the film, we watch it with hindsight. So we understand that Robert Kennedy, uh, life was cut short two years after this. So it's when you watch the film, you're watching it with all of this context. Or, and when you dig into the story, you're understanding all of this context. Um, there was even a, a newspaper headline we show um, in the film that says something or, or not a newspaper headline, but someone had written in like an editorial that said, um, Oxford, Mississippi may be the next Dallas. I mean, so things like that were swimming around. I can't imagine what it would be like to, to go into a situation where people are saying things like that, writing things like that. Um, and so certainly it was a tense atmosphere and she expressed that saying, you know, just what she said, that she, the first I said, what, what do you remember when you walked on, onto that stage? And she said, well, honestly, I remember looking for the exits just because I thought we might want to know. But then she immediately launched into saying how warm of a reception it was, how they were so surprised and pleased um, at how welcoming everyone seemed. And they were getting multiple standing ovations, I think, which was surprising to a lot of people. It wasn't just polite applause, they could have just clapped once, you know, enough to be polite and then move on. But there was such a kind of roaring applause. So I think she really wanted to convey that she remembered it being um, a surprisingly positive and, and welcoming event, but certainly she felt very tense going in. Well, I think he also charmed the audience. I think he also knew that he was, he was going into this hostile territory. He, he's charming the audience. Um, I want to talk a little bit about kind of this, um, the planted questions, <laughs> um, because, um, and the gentleman who asked those questions, and I mean, you said that you, you started out finding out this by doing an oral history with him that kind of led you more into this. Can you tell us about kind of that, that planted question and, you know, for people who may not have watched the film, kind of give them a little bit of the, What's, what's happening when Kennedy is, 
is there. He's, he gives a speech, then there's time for questions, and the first question goes to uh, a person who is planted in the audience. Yes, so that person was Frank Baxton, who's in the film, interviewed current day in the film, uh, now a lawyer in Greenville. Um, he was a law student at the time, and so basically the whole Law School Speakers Bureau plan around this was that they knew these tapes existed. They had worked with an undergraduate named Cleveland Donald. Um, he was an undergraduate, undergraduate history major, the second black student to graduate from Ole Miss um, from Jackson, Mississippi. He later went on and got a PhD at Cornell and, and came back to the university and everything. But so he was a um, undergrad student who knew through his networks, organizing and being involved in the movement that he basically had connections to Senator Kennedy's office. And they knew that this had happened and it had been rumored, but never concretely uh, affirmed in the public. No one, Robert Kennedy had never confirmed it in the public. So Cleveland goes to Washington DC and actually expecting to speak to uh, just the Senator's staff, but he actually gets to speak to Robert Kennedy himself. That's how they arrange this plan where Robert Kennedy basically says, um, yeah, I'd love to come down there and give a speech, but only if there's a question and answer period, kind of like wink, wink, you know, only if there's a question and answer period, I think y'all know the question I want to be asked, but he stipulated, he, Robert Kennedy stipulated that he didn't want to seem like uh, he was just coming down to blast Barnett, Barnett, because then that would, first of all, it would mean it would probably not happen for all the reasons we're discussing, the speaker's ban and everything else, but it would also be, you know, I think he's looking at the strategy and the optics of the situation, and it will be better received if it seems like someone is pulling it out of him, right? So he doesn't look like he's just coming down there with the agenda. So he actually says, you're going to have to ask me a few times. I'm going to I'm gonna kind of dodge it. Oh, I'm not here, I'm not down here to talk about all that. And then finally answer it. So the, the Law School Speakers Bureau, which would be uh, my dad, Ed Ellington, who was the chairman of the Speakers Bureau. And part of the reason that they chose Ed um, is they deliberately, they were so worried about how this would be perceived and, and uh, potentially derailed. So they wanted to choose people at the the time um, at Ellington, his politics weren't really known on campus. Like my dad was explaining, you know, he knew that he would be all for Robert Kennedy coming down, but maybe other students didn't really know what Ed's politics were. And that was good. That was a good cover. It wouldn't attract attention. And then they chose Frank to ask the question because Frank um, grew up in the Delta. He has this real Southern drawl. You can hear it in the film. And they, that was important to them. They wanted to pick someone who had a really obvious Southern accent so that it wouldn't seem like, so that people couldn't just say, oh, that's some plant from New York. Ironically, it is a plant, <laughs> but it's a plant from Greenville. Um, but, um, or he might've been in Clarksdale at the time, but it's a plant from Mississippi. So they wanted it to seem homegrown. They wanted it to seem, which it was, and they wanted it to seem like the students were really in charge and they were just pulling this out of Kennedy. And then he finally relents and answers. So the, the question was arranged, very first question before the event could get derailed about some other thing and get off on some other subject. They're like, first question, Frank's going to ask, talk to us about Barnett during the Meredith crisis. Yeah, I mean, it's a really do kind of press that question. But I mean, what, when you were talking, one of the things I thought about was the, the letter that we looked at yesterday from M.M. Roberts. And so this idea of having people who they think they, everybody knows they're Mississippians because the perception by Roberts was these students are being overly influenced by these professors at the law school who are from Yale and Harvard. We should only have these professors from Southern law schools who understand our ways and our customs. It's, you know, it's, it's both closed society, but it's also rather contemporary given some of the things that are happening on this campus right now with, with academic freedom. Um, but they were, um, they understood this idea of academic freedom and they were just, they found this work around through it. And thinking about that, what do you see as the real legacy of this, this event for 
this university? What's a, but I mean, I guess it, that's two questions really. The legacy for the university and the, the political legacy of this. Did this maybe uh, undermine Ross Barnett's campaign for governor? He did, he came in fourth, I believe. Um, and even though as Curtis Wilkie said in the film, that everyone thought that Ross Barnett was going to be the, the person who's gonna take the lead. Did this, do you, do you think this had any influence on the politics of the time? That's a question, you know, I've been trying to answer this whole time and it's hard for me to answer the question uh, being, you know, studying it from a historical point of view. Obviously I wasn't there. I've talked to many people, not only the people we interviewed in this film, but others who remember it from the time who feel strongly that it had an influence of course, that's their personal opinion. I mean, I don't, I can't prove historically on an academic level, I can't prove the cause and effect because there's so many factors that go into that. Um, but it was certainly becoming, from, from what I understand from reading and listening to people's accounts, it was steadily becoming clear already, but, but uh, really driven home by this event that Ross Barnett was just more and more of caught red-handed as a liar. And so even though you had Mississippians who, unfortunately, um, then and today, you know, still uh, may have stood by some of his ideologies, they, they seemed to be at least, there was a certain segment of them, well, I suppose there's a certain segment who would just be his base no matter what, you know, but then there's a certain segment who at least did not want to be led by someone who is so clearly lying, who is so clearly incompetent. You know, it, they, that was at least enough to, to bother them enough that they did not want to support him specifically anymore. And I've talked to a lot of people who think that this was kind of the final nail in the coffin of his political career, that it just, once this went around Mississippi, there were 6,000 people at this event. So they really couldn't, deny it, Ross and his camp and his ilk really couldn't deny this anymore. I mean, they, they, and we get into this in film and I don't even know if we're gonna show maybe a clip about some of this, but part of the context is that the press in Mississippi, especially the Clarion Ledger at the time out of Jackson and the Hederman controlled press was so driving home uh, this segregationist white supremacist propaganda and they were, they were in, uh, association with Ross Barnett, it was hard to get things out. But if you have a live event and a national figure comes down and you have 200 news people from all over the world and 6,000 people, well, that's 6,000 people who are eyewitnesses to what Robert Kennedy said. Now that doesn't make what Robert Kennedy said true, but it does make it true that he said it. So at the very minimum, you have 6,000 people who, who can attest that he said this. Rumors are now going wild and it just kind of became, from what I understand, really a, a final nail in the coffin. Like Ross was already looking bad and he just, this was like, this guy's ridiculous. This guy's a buffoon. We just can't, we gotta get him out of here. This is embarrassing. I think it finally became embarrassing enough, which is very sad to think that that's what it took. Yeah, I mean, because in, <laughs> who did they elect after that? They elect John Bell Williams, who is just, a, who's also another type of buffoon, but, but I think that it was, you know, still in the same, ilk as, as Ross Barnett, but wasn't Ross Barnett. I mean, we've talked about this. Mississippi's not a state, it's a club. Uh, so you've got 6,000 people in the club who all know this. And that kind of gets the whole gossip mill going in the club. So Ross essentially gets voted out of the club. That's what happens. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's essentially what, what, what happened. So, um, have a few questions here, one to kind of get to those, and we might want to go back and look at that, that clip that you mentioned earlier. We still have time. Um, and this is a question from Sarah Marie Campbell, and she says, one of the most powerful parts of the film for me was hearing about how many people gave up and left Mississippi. Um, do you see a trend to stay and improve Mississippi, and what do you think it would take to make that happen? Um, your thoughts about that. What was the last, I didn't hear the last part. What do you think it would take to make, make it happen for more people to want to stay in Mississippi? Oh, I mean, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's part of the problem, this closed society atmosphere that we're looking at in this 
film uh, over 50 years ago feels all too relevant today. Um, it, we still have many of these same problems today. As you're saying on campus, the, the University of Mississippi campus is still struggling with various controversies relating to the administration and the IHL and academic freedom and freedom of professors. You know, we think about the close society, Jim Silver, he basically gets run out of Mississippi. Joss Morris, the dean of law school featured in this film, he and his wife left Mississippi a few years after this. They just couldn't, the environment was so hostile to them. They were being harassed. His wife was being harassed socially. It was, why would people stay, you know? And of course, as I say that, you know, if you're from here, you know that we love this place and we love Mississippi. And so people want to stay, but, um, I wish that we had leadership uh, that created more of a climate that wants everyone to stay and wants to value everyone. I mean, that's kind of an obvious statement, but to put it simply, if we had leadership that really valued everybody, more people would be able to stay and, and have incentives to stay and, would, and could stay. I mean, brain drain is a huge problem in Mississippi today, and we can see why in the climate. Yeah, I mean, that kind of brings to mind that, you know, just aside this, listening to Amy Inazuka Matato talk yesterday about being a transplant to Mississippi and how there are people who will think that maybe she doesn't have a right to speak out. But then it's like, if you live here, you're invested in it. And I think we, as Mississippians, have to move away from the, the well, it's only if you are, if you are from here or you've been here for generations that you can really speak. There are even people who, who think that I shouldn't because I kind of live in, in two places and my family's actually from Alabama. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, that's part of the, that is part of the strategy though of this group that the same mentality that wants to put in place a speaker ban that says no one from outside the state can speak without a permission. What's interesting about that is that it's even presupposing that people from within the state would necessarily be agreeing with this segregationist agenda. You see what I'm saying? Like it's ignoring homegrown people who of course have always been here fighting against that and, and organizing against that. This, this supposition um, that home, real, to, to keep it homegrown, which really means white homegrown to be clear, yes. like politically, that is what they mean. So you have a whole 40% of Mississippi they're ignoring as Mississippians. And then they have this idea that of some kind of purity thing and we're in the in club and we want to keep things the way they are and don't listen to those lies from from those, those people those liberals somewhere else and the news and fake news and everybody's lying to you i mean that mm M. roberts so to for people listening mm M. roberts was on the ihl board at this time um and we have this this um letter from him where he says in the letter i actually have it right here he says um there's a, because there, you're making me think of it, there's a, a specific quote about, he says, I believe that I could do some good to the law school. This is, he's re referencing Bobby Kennedy coming to appear, um, February 12th, 1966. Um, I could do some good in, to the law school and the University of Mississippi in my consistent effort to stop liberalism on the campus there in the law school. I regret Bobby Kennedy is to come to the University of Mississippi um, in any kind of basis. This constitutes an affront to the entire board of trustees of the institutions of higher learning in my judgment. Uh, I have absolutely no respect for him as a man or, le or a legislator or as an American. And I regret that the institution has gotten on such a low ebb as to invite him. And I cannot see how the leadership at the University of Mississippi could be so stupid. So that's, that's your IHL board member speaking about inviting the former attorney general of the United States to the law school. Well, and, and also keep in mind that we, are, we think we're talking about a, a Mississippi past, but, but the structures that are part of that past still exist. We still have an IHL board. And that IHL board is, was, is really by design to, for, I mean, for lack of a better term, to take on some form of social control. Um, so, and you know, as Mississippians thinking about this, I think one of the things to keep people here is to make sure that people don't, that we 
get rid of some of the structures that keep perpetuating these things that happened in the past. Absolutely. Um, another question from Mary Knight. Uh, she says, congratulations on the film, you this award. What did making this film teach you about dreaming big, so, so to speak, and who to interview and how to get those interviews? Um, hmm. That's, that's a multi-layered question. What did the film teach me? First of all, it taught me that archivally based films take forever. <laughs> <laughs> Search anything that involves searching through archives, um, even though that was one of the most fun and exciting parts of it. But I mean, I, I was literally down on the microfilm machine. I had to learn, you know, me from my generation, I had to learn what a microfilm machine is and like crank through it and, and look at all these old um, photos from the, the Mississippi, which I have some of those too, we were talking about. Um, yeah, because it, yeah, because I think it would be interesting to show some of those political cartoons, because I think we, um, as I was telling you, since I was the nerdy kid who read the newspaper, I remember these, these political cartoons. Could you show, you know, maybe one or two of those? That could be- Well, for the- for the political cartoons, I could just show like a two minute clip of that part of the film yeah, where they're yeah. shown, if that's just as well. I also have some newspaper and we can do this or not, but I have some front pages of the Daily Mississippian pulled up from all around that time that kind of don't, that mention Robert Kennedy is coming, he's gonna be here next week, the speech is still on because they were having all this controversy and trying to get it canceled. But it's interesting to see the other cultural context of that time around it. Because also on the front page is the band, The Birds. And they're all there with their very 60s haircuts and says, also the birds are coming, you know? And, or you have an ad for the, um, for the Peace Corps that mentions Dr. Strangelove. That's in the same newspaper as uh, the same edition on the same page. So it's, for me, it's interesting to put that in context with what's going on in pop culture in America and these students Another, another touch point for me that my mom pointed out to me is that this, um, my mom, ever the Beatles fan, reminded me that this event happened between Rubber Soul and Revolver for the Beatles. That helps me like put it where, you know, on the timeline to just think that all that's happening at the same time, but, um, but here on the campus of Mississippi, it's like we can't even, we're just trying to get past a, a speaker ban. But yeah. we, we're stuck in the in the 50s. I mean, that's one of the things I'm always taken by when doing archival research in that time is you have this cognitive dissonance when you see the people with the long hair, the bands that are coming here, and then you see everyone dressed as if it's 1955. <laughs> <laughs> so do you want to, um, I can play that clip. Yes, okay. that up. Let me see. And then we'll take a couple more questions. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to play this for about two, two and a half minutes. Okay. Uh, behind closed doors, no one knew at the time that he was having those conversations. The local press, the Hederman Press in, in Jackson, it, it was like a propaganda machine for the segregationist leadership. I mean, and they would not print those things. They were very powerful influence in supporting candidates. They had a direct telephone line to the governor's office. You couldn't call them a newspaper. They were an organ for white supremacy. And then the TV stations were the same way. No, if I may, we don't regard this as integration at the University of Mississippi. We regard it simply as military occupation. I was going to ask, what about the rights of these other 5,000 yeah. students at Ole Miss? Have they no right to an education? Well, of course they do. It was like in Mississippi, where James Silver, Professor Silver, wrote a book called Mississippi, The Closed Society. Well, it was closed largely by the press. When you have that kind of propaganda just being hammered home again and again, and you're not being exposed to any alternative viewpoints, uh, it created a real atmosphere of, of fear and worry and uncertainty. People in power made you feel under siege, that everybody's just picking on us. So there was a good bit of animosity towards people outside the South. 
If you agree that individual liberty and constitutional government must be preserved, if you want to do something positive and worthwhile to help protect our freedom, then we want to hear from you. Just write to Citizens Council, Jackson, Mississippi. We'll okay, so... Yeah, that's, that's, that's really... You know, I mean, I, as I said, I remember read, seeing that stuff in the paper. Um, and I think that really gives people a sense of what was, I mean, the information people were getting. So it's very difficult if this is what, what you're being bombarded with every day to actually begin to see what's going on. So these, these students, I think, were, they knew that how the media worked in Mississippi. And this is a way for them, almost they're subverting the media as well. Right, absolutely. And one of the things that always gets me about that, that uh, TV ad for the Citizens Council is that it says, write to the Citizens Council at the end. And you just have to address your envelope, Citizens Council. Like they know where to, <laughs> they know where to find it. They don't have <laughs> an office address. Um, I'm trying to get these uh, newspapers queued up if you just want to look at these real quick. Just to glance at them for context. Yeah, there's just a couple more questions I want to get to so in, the, in the time we have left. So, oh yes, this is a great. <laughs> so we have, uh, y'all are just seeing the, yeah, y'all can see this if I zoom in? Yes. Yeah. In the Daily Mississippian, this is a week before the event, March 11th, some fraternity thing they're doing. We have the birds are coming. Then uh, March 16th, that's uh, two days before the event, you know, you have another, an article about how Harvard law professors are going to lecture. That's the M.M. Roberts letter, one of the ones I didn't read, where he's saying to the law school dean, is there any way we can get rid of all the law school um, professors who are from Harvard or Yale? And actually, I have it right here. He he's said, Archibald Cox, who's involved in um, Watergate hearings. Right. Well, he becomes a Watergate special, special prosecutor. He says... Um, I hope you eliminate the Harvard and Yale faculty members from the university campus and that you select all of your professors from those who are conservative and from the conservative South. You know, so this is happening the same week they have these people coming. Um, you have ride in action junked by Jackson APWR. That was a, a white supremacist group that was threatening to do this ride in uh, protest at Robert Kennedy, but they uh, apparently the action was junked. Um, and then you have the day before, plans for Kennedy visits still not certain. You have this picture of the doors. I just think the cultural context of that's really interesting. And then, I mean, it's a, it's, as I said, there's a great deal of, of cognitive dissonance that you get looking at this. I think um, you know, see, there's a question here from, from uh, Afton Thomas, and, um, <laughs> and it just sees this parallel between the event in 66 and the, you know, the black student protest that took place here in, in 1970, which involved Cleve Donald's brother. Yes. Um, and it, so it's, it just brings up this whole issue that I think we like to think of Mississippi as this place where, or the University of Mississippi as this place where there is no student dissent. Um, but it's interesting how there is this, I mean, there's this long tradition of creative ways of disrupting things for the, the sake of change. Um, and do you want to kind of talk about kind of that, how you see this as fitting in with that history? Because I know you know the connection between Cleve Donnell and John Donnell, who was his brother, who, was also, who became a law student here, but was kicked out of law school when he participated in the Up With People protest in Fulton Chapel in February of 1970. Right, and, and not to mention uh, Donald Cole, who is interviewed in this film, talking about the time period. Um, yeah, I mean, there's absolutely this thread that went on long after this event in 66 and had started long before this event in 66. Um, and there's always been, of course, the activists on the ground and, of course, the the the, the brunt of the burden and the work has always been borne by black Missis Mississippians and organizers. So you have this whole civil rights movement. I mean, it's not like it's not in context with that. So one of the things I wanted to make sure in the film is that you don't, I don't want to overly emphasize just Robert Kennedy's role or overly 
I don't want to overstate or overly hero, heroize him for coming down and making a speech as if it changed everything. Clearly it did not. Um, and that's not the purpose. The purpose is to look at how all of these issues circle around this event. Absolutely. And how he fits into the thread of student activism and just Mississippi activism that's always been present and continues on to, the day, uh, to this day. So I wanted to see how that weaves in with all of that. But there's certainly, there's so many, um, the, the thread of that student dissent and pushing back clearly continues to today. Um, and that's part of one of the quotes near the end of the film, Dr. Ross is saying, you know, the university still had a long way to go. So much happened shortly after this in the seventies, eighties onto the present. It was important for me to include lines like that so that I didn't want the film to end with some kind of happy, un unrealistic, happy ending. It's not a happy ending. It's a complex ending and we're still in it. Yeah. Um, because it does feel, this does feel very contemporary. Um, you know, was there, one, this is a question from John Rash you know, that um, he said he'd like to know about the events that you learned about along the way that didn't make it into the film and why. Well, there's many little vignettes and you and I have talked about some of them that didn't make it into the film. It's such a, any, I really learned on this one, especially with a, a feature length. You know, they talk about you have to cut your darlings in the in the film, in the edit room. It's so hard to let go of some of the things. Um, little stuff like, well, like the story about um, the advance team that Robert Kennedy sent down to check out security, understandably, before the situation. He sent down a whole team to kind of scope out the security. And then on the day of, they had guards at every plug, every electric plug leading to the sound system. And my dad and some of the other students were there with the Law School Speakers Bureau, like in the morning, getting ready for all of this. And, and so this is one of the interviews that got cut, but he was explaining, asking one of them, like, you don't have to do that. Or like, we can get a student to do that. Or like, don't worry about, like, you don't have to put a guard at every single plug. And the guy said to him, young man, you, this must be your first rodeo, because we're not, like, we do not even believe that someone's not going to pull the plug to the microphone at this event. But whether that would have happened or not, who knows, but the fact that that's how they were viewing it. Um, another interesting little story, side story, as I was mentioning earlier, driving from the airport, um, uh, Robert Kennedy and, and Ethel landed in Oxford. They had to drive into Oxford and Robert Kennedy actually specifically requested um, to, to take the long way and kind of, he said he wanted to see the neighborhoods, he wanted to see these rural areas, he wanted to drive around in the outskirts of town, and he, he wanted to see the poorer neighborhoods. This was his first trip to Mississippi, and of course we know the following year he came back for his famous trip to the Delta with Marion Wright, uh, Marion Wright Edelman, and um, he, as it's recalled, he was just silent and staring out the window, but, but ever curious to see this. So there's so many little vignettes about that happened in conjunction with this. Yeah, um, I guess another question is from Jonathan Smith. So as a native Mississippian, what surprised you the most as you dug deeper into this story? Is there anything that really began to, and I, I know that for most of us who, who've grown up here, there is very little that can surprise us, but I'm always finding something because there's always something that, that has been kept silent for years. What is it that, that really surprised you as you dug deeper into this story? I don't know, like you said, it's hard for me to be surprised, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but there were little things just about the time period that are so interesting for me to see. I mean, honestly, the Ross Barnett campaign song was one, I, I'm not even kidding, because I really did, I hadn't heard it before. And well, I, I'm, not, I'm not, in the 50s. <laughs> uh, there was another one, I had to, it was painful to choose between the two Ross Burnett campaign songs that I had as options, they're both so ludicrous. But it, you know, it's like, it wasn't surprising, but to hear it and kind of really get it through my head, like that was an actual campaign song on the radio, you know? Um, and other little things about the time that just kind of stood out, uh, you know, several people in their, in their interview answers, and they didn't mean anything by it, they were describing the times, but they, they kept saying, well, the law students would wanted to come and then the wives wanted to come. 
the wives are a separate category. From the law students, obviously, the law students would be men. I think they may have had a few female law students at this time, but there was still a culture of referring to them as the law students and the wives. <laughs> and then they decided to open it to uh, include the wives, and then it included the whole uh, campus, and then it included people from the public could buy tickets, you know? But like little details like that from the moment um, or hearing someone speak about the dean of women at the time they had a dean of women, the separate thing. You know, those are those are new things to me. So that all kind of colors the time and that combined with the picture of the birds or this is right before Revolver came out or what I, like I'm trying as a person who wasn't there to use whatever touch points I have. Yeah, I mean, there, there are always these these things that do. I think it's the, it's the cultural touch points that I think that really do um, surprise you when you begin to dig in an archival project like this. Um, and I mean, those, those newspapers that you were showing, really great examples of that, of how you see how the outside world, even though you're, we're, you know, we're talking about an event that was really trying to keep the outside world out of Mississippi, how it was still very much a part of it. And that it's, you know, just to be blunt about it, it's a bit of a fool's errand to think that you can, you can keep any of this out. Um, you know, particularly now that, you know, information really travels so, so fast. Uh, I think we're just about at an hour now, um, but anything you want to say to just kind of conclude, Mary, because it's, I mean, I, I have to say that what I found really fascinating about this project is how contemporary it feels uh, and how there are things that um, some of the, the language and framing um, has evolved over time, but it's still very much the same, um, same coded speech. It's just, it's just evolved. And, right. and I think that it's, I think that's what's the great thing about looking at something like this from history. We were able to connect that with the present. So these things that happened in the past don't seem that far away. And that's what's, you know, this event, you know, as I said, is something I remember, but also where you see the, how the attitudes that are there are still with us. And I think that's probably what, what affected me the most. And I think probably affected a lot of people who were watching this. So I want to thank you for, for this work and for getting something out to the public that, that does just that without really kind of saying, connecting the past and the present, you're leaving it there for the, the viewer to make that connection. So, thank you. Thank you, yeah, and that, is, that was definitely part of what I was trying to do. It was, it was uh, unavoidable and working on it, the connections to the present, and it's, it's, you know, it's sad and disheartening that there's so many, so much of this is still relevant, but I guess maybe the takeaway is that the good side is also still here and alive and well and was there then too. So I guess it's, it's both, it's certainly both, but um, even like reading this, this letter earlier, I mean, it's like you say, the coded language, what's interesting that the main difference to me between this and some of what we hear from some of our leaders today is that this is just being explicit. This is just saying it out loud and admitting it and, and maybe not couching it in the new modern version of some old things. But we've, we've, got, uh, we've got the, as you said, we've got the dissent and the resistance here too that's always been here. Well, thank you, Mary. It's been a fascinating conversation. We're really um, very glad that this film is out there. And, and for those who are watching who haven't watched the film, I would urge you to do so. Um, and I want to just thank you, Mary. I want to thank the Center for the Study of Southern Culture for, for this event and also uh, urge people to come to tomorrow's event on Who's Blues um, with Adam Gussell and uh, Brian Foster. So thank you, Mary, and thanks to everyone. Absolutely. Thank you so much.